I hauled my ass to the laundromat on a typical gray Sunday morning at 7. I had no idea if it was a gray day outside, but I guess everyone feels that way when they're in the laundry room on a Sunday morning. I have only used the laundry service for the last year or so. Before this, my wife did our laundry in our own laundry room in the basement of our house. I moved out about a year ago, and six months ago, my wife became my ex-wife, and the laundry room was now in my former home. So I started a new habit of going to the laundromat, located a mile from my apartment, early on Sunday morning. Although I don't really like getting up early to do laundry, I didn't want this ritual to disrupt my weekend, so I showed up early to the laundromat and left early. I avoided the hassle of waiting for a car on a busy day and having to engage in polite conversation with other patrons. After all, aren't Sunday mornings meant to be hungover and quietly read the newspaper? I've been going to the same laundromat for the past nine months or so, and maybe I've seen it before but never paid attention to it. But this time, it was different. One of the wheels of the cart that she... The pull seemed to be slightly bent, causing the cart to roll unsteadily. She was overwhelmed with dirty clothes, and it was difficult for her to roll them behind her with one hand and try to hold the door open with the other. I saw this while looking through a sports paper, and being the generally good guy I am, I put the paper down, walked up to the door, and held it open like a gentleman while she pulled the cart inside. She looked up at me and gave me a 100-megawatt smile, with perfect white teeth and big brown eyes. Thank you, mister, she said, walking toward the row of washing machines along the far wall of the laundry room. I thought she was about seven or eight years old, mixed race or possibly Hispanic, with a head of long curly brown hair. She was simply charming. I turned around, expecting to see my parents walking behind me, but they weren't there. Now I was alarmed and intrigued. I watched a child load a whole stack of clothes into the washing machine without separating the colored items from the white ones, as I was taught. Then she put some washing powder that she carried in her cart, put the money in the car, and pressed the start button. She took a small teddy bear out of her bag, sat down on a chair, and began talking to it quietly while the washing machine did its job. From where I stood, almost on the other side of the laundry room, I could see that the clothes she wore jeans, a long sleeve shirt, and a pink jacket, too light for the 6.5 degree morning, had seen better days. Although they were not dirty, they faded with age and wear. She looked one step better than a street bum, but there was a calmness in her behavior that simply did not fit into my head. I also couldn't believe that parents would send such a small child alone to wash the family's clothes. Being a parent myself, I just knew something wasn't right about this whole thing which brought me back to my own business. My children, at this very moment, were probably asleep, tucked into their warm, comfortable beds in my former home. When they wake up, perhaps an hour or two later, their mother, my ex-wife, will likely have a hot breakfast of pancakes and eggs, and maybe bacon, ready for them. My 13-year-old son, Ethan, is a big fan of bacon, and my 15-year-old daughter, Haley, prefers pancakes. My favorite food was waffles, but those days of happy Sunday morning breakfast with family became a fast-fading memory. As is expected in a divorce, my wife received custody of the children, and although I received some visitation rights, my wife, in all her nastiness, turned the children against me, blaming my selfishness for the destruction of our family. My kids wanted nothing to do with me, and that was very obvious the few times we were together. My crime not sitting still while my wife cheated on me with another man during a long weekend trip with three other couples and the man she ended up having sex with, a rich guy who made it a point to have sex with wives of other men. She and he worked out this plan to have sex for one night, and then she would come back to me and be completely faithful to me for the rest of our lives, just like she was before the weekend. Since she told me about it in advance, it was not cheating, she claimed, but in case I wanted to make a fuss, she would take half my money, half my things, the whole house, and, as luck would have it, ruin my relationship with the children, which, of course, she will get it. When I refused, she got everything she promised, and, of course, shifted the blame onto me. The kids bought it. I was completely screwed. Thinking about those family breakfasts made me feel hungry. 
as I hadn't eaten anything since the last hot dog slid down my throat. Along with the Mickey's malt beer at the bar, I was sitting at watching the Knicks game. There was a poor imitation of a vending machine on one wall, with a Coke machine next to it. I was sure that whoever owns the laundry collects money from both machines every day. Otherwise, they would have been hacked and ruined long ago. I bought a pack of M&Ms and a Diet Coke. Just as I was taking out a can of Coke, I glanced at the little girl. She seemed to be quietly watching me, but then I realized that she was not looking at me, but at my snacks. Like I said, I'm someone's father, and the look on her face when she looked at my snacks hurt my heart. I walked over to where she was sitting and quietly asked if she wanted my Diet Coke and M&Ms. She brightened noticeably and sat straight in her chair, then a sad expression appeared on her face, and she refused my offer. Mom says I shouldn't take food from strangers, especially men, she explained. That's a very good rule, honey, and you should always listen to what your mommy says, I agreed. I'll tell you what. I'll just put the soda and M&Ms on the chair next to you, and you can take them if you want. I'll get some more and go back to my place. I put the food down, went back to the machines, and bought myself another Diet Coke and another bag of M&Ms. I then returned to my seat and picked up the newspaper, secretly watching her from above. After about five minutes, she grabbed a soda and M&Ms and got down to business. I smiled to myself. I left after about 90 minutes, folding my two bags and putting them in the car. I didn't think about the baby as I left, immersed in my life and how I was going to spend the rest of Sunday. To be honest, I didn't think about the baby again until I went to the laundromat the following Sunday, again around 7 a.m. Then I wondered if she would appear again. Of course, about half an hour later, she came to the door, again dragging a cart full of clothes. I held the door for her again. She thanked me again and heeded towards the machinis on the far wall. I noticed that she was wearing the same clothes as last week. I waited for her to start loading, then carefully walked over and sat down in the seat next to her. I see you have a problem with the rear wheel on your wagon, honey. Is it okay if I try to fix it? She nodded affirmatively, playing with her teddy bear. I turned the cart over and saw that the rear right wheel was bent on the axle. I straightened it out with my hands and then rolled the cart back and forth to check my work. Instant wagon repair. My little friend looked impressed. I'm Alex Rogers, by the way, I said, extending my hand for a handshake. She extended her small hand with as much dignity as she could muster and said in a somber voice, Maddie Ruiz, I'm very pleased to meet you, sir. Well, now that we've introduced ourselves, we're not strangers anymore, I said. What do you say about soda and candy? Can I have a real cola this week? She asked, her eyes wide and questioning. Certainly. One real Coke for you, a Diet Coke for me, and a few M&Ms for both of us. We sat and talked for almost two hours. I took a notepad and pen from the car and introduced her to the game Tic-Tac-Toe. It took her about five minutes to figure out what was what, but then she started to get the hang of it. I let her win a few times, just like I let my kids win sometimes. For a minute or two, I was lost in my own little world thinking about playing with my children. Then I was lost in thought about how my then-wife Tracy, looking me straight in the face, told me she was going to sleep with Robert Goldstein III, a big city lawyer, on the night that ended my life as I knew it. It's just one night, Alex. It won't mean anything. It will just be sex. What? Are you kidding me? It won't be just sex. This will be the end of our marriage, I yelled back. Don't be like that, Alex, she shouted back. Don't throw away 18 years of marriage because of one night. I didn't sneak behind your back like I could have. We could do this, and you might never have guessed it. Just give it to me, Alex. Tracy took Robert's hand and walked with him to his bedroom in the four-room cottage. After standing with my mouth open for what seemed like several hours, but most likely only a minute, I took my things and left. Alex! Now it's your turn, Maddie said, bringing me back to the present. I marked an X in one of the side boxes, and this gave Maddie a chance to get three O's in a row, diagonally to win. 
she put on her best triumphant face as she marked the line through her three. High five, I said, holding my hand at arm's length from her. She looked at me sideways, then stood on her chair and was able to reach my hand to complete the high five. Hold it, she said. I stayed in the laundry room until Maddie's clothes were washed and folded. I offered to give her a ride home, but she said she couldn't agree because it was mommy's rules. Mom is a smart woman. I'd like to meet her sometime, I said. Well, maybe someday. She doesn't go out in public very often, Maddie replied. We continued to communicate with Maddie as winter turned into spring and spring into summer. I started packing a small bag with sandwiches for both of us and snacks and bought soda from the laundromat. At this time in the morning, I didn't feel like eating, but I thought that if I ate a sandwich, she would eat too, and she was terribly thin. Then I started packing an extra sandwich, telling her she could take the extra one home for her mother. She didn't protest at all, and always thanked me. By this time, she told me that she was indeed seven years old and would be a second grader in the fall at an elementary school in our area. My father wasn't home, and in fact, Maddie told me that she had never met her father. Her mother apparently worked outside the home while Maddie went to school, and although she didn't know what her mother did, she was always home by the time Maddie came home from school. Most often, he and his mother stayed in their apartment, sometimes going to the park when the weather was good. They mostly watched TV, and Maddie was familiar with almost all the latest cartoons that were shown on the children's channels. I couldn't name even one of them. There seemed to be no money for extra services, but the mother sometimes went on dates on Saturday nights leaving Maddie after dinner with instructions to go to bed at 9 p.m. On Sunday morning, her mother woke her up, gave her money for one washing machine and one dryer, and sent her with a cart to the laundry. Truth be told, my life at that point wasn't much better than Maddie's, although I at least had enough money to live on. With alimony, mortgage payments, and child support, my lead programmer's salary didn't leave much money for extra fun usually a random night out at a bar with friends. I didn't go on dates at all. I didn't miss it. However, I missed my kids, at least until I remembered how they treated me after Tracy and I broke up. I preferred to think about happier times with them, but reality always jumped up and bit me. Where the hell are you? Tracy screamed when I answered the phone at my house the morning after I left Robert Goldstein's lake house. My phone showed that it was 10.06, as far as I remembered, it was already 2.13 when I downed another portion of Eagle Rare bourbon. I must have eventually staggered to the bedroom and fallen asleep. You left me to my own devices, in a house by the lake. How do I get home? She shouted at me again. Fuck you! Let Robert Goldstein III take you home! I turned off the phone while she screamed something else. Hell, you can't hang up on a cell phone as quickly as you can with a landline. In the old days... I would definitely smash my phone against the wall by throwing it at it. The following Sunday, Maddie showed up at the laundromat 15 minutes later than usual and without her bag of clothes. Tears were streaming down her young face, and I thought she must have been robbed. She carried her teddy bear, holding it under her right arm. Mom didn't come home last night, and I don't have money for washing machines, she said when I approached. Does she sometimes not come home? I asked as softly as possible. She shook her head, her big brown eyes shining with tears. Mom always comes home. This is another one of her rules. I calmed her down and gave her the food I had brought with me for her. I was in another territory and didn't know what to do. Is there someone you can stay with until your mom comes home? I asked. She shook her head again, this time with a mouthful of peanut butter and jelly. I knew I couldn't leave her alone in the apartment, but if I called the police without a plan... They would undoubtedly place her in foster care within a day, and possibly take her away from her mother forever if they thought she wasn't good enough to take care of the child, which I already had doubts about. How about we go to your apartment and leave your mom a note saying we're at my apartment? She can call me when she gets home, and I will bring you to her. I saw her wheels start turning. It was a violation of one of her mother's rules. But since her mother didn't come home, I don't think she wanted to spend the day alone in her apartment. She finally nodded in agreement. After folding my things and putting them in the car, we went first to her apartment. We didn't collect anything from Maddie's apartment because there was simply nothing to collect there. The few pieces of clothing she had, she had either already worn or were lying among the dirty clothes awaiting their turn at the laundry. 
I told her we would stop somewhere and I would buy her a few things, including a new toothbrush and comb. She smiled sadly. I left a note with my name and phone number on the middle of the small kitchen table. Then we went to get Maddie's things. I let her pick out a few tops and pairs of jeans, as well as underwear and socks at the nearby Dollar General. While she seemed absolutely delighted, I was trying to figure out what I should do if her mom didn't come back quickly. We watched cartoons and the Disney Channel. I prepared lunch and dinner for us, and at nine o'clock, I put her to bed in the spare room. On the sofa. I planned to call work the next day and take a personal day to sort out some things. Maddie and I waited until lunchtime to go back to her apartment on Monday, but there was no sign that anyone had been there since the two of us the day before. I poked around the apartment a little and found a drawer in her mother's dresser that contained papers. Among the items found was Maddie's birth certificate, which I noticed did not have the father's name on it. Her mother's name was Fiona Ruiz. I took the birth certificate, along with a photo of Maddie and her mother. The photo was likely taken when Maddie was about two years old. She looked little more than a child. They hugged in front of the camera. Fiona looked to be about 25 years old and had the same long, curly brown hair as Maddie. They were both smiling in the photo, and although Fiona was a beautiful woman, her eyes still looked tired and sad. I wondered to myself if this look had grown over the past few years. Maddie watched as I carefully sorted through her mother's things. I tried to make light conversation with her and explained that I was looking for something that could help us find her mother. She seemed to accept it. When we got back to my apartment, I turned on the TV to the Disney Channel and sat Maddie down, then went to my bedroom, called the police and reported Fiona Ruiz missing. I didn't have anything to say to the officer who took the call. Basically, I said that something had to happen to her for her to leave her child alone. Is the child alone in the apartment now, sir? Asked the officer. No, she's with me. I am the child's closest friend. I'll be happy to keep her with me until everything is resolved. If you agree to do this until the guardianship service contacts you, I will be very grateful to you. I was worried that Maddie would end up in a foster home somewhere. No one I know who was in foster care spoke well of the system. I knew I could do everything right if I was allowed to keep her. While I was thinking about this, somewhere in the back of my mind I remembered that my boss's wife, Darlene, has powerful friends in the social services industry. Maybe I can negotiate a favor. I'd like to think my boss and I were on good terms. I worked for him for 20 years and did a damn good job for his company. We always got along well on a personal level and he and his wife were there for me during the divorce. Darlene Luster showed up at my apartment about 20 minutes after my conversation with her husband. She said she wanted to make a new friend. I introduced her to Maddie, and like the Pied Piper, Darlene charmed the girl within five minutes, and vice versa. When she left about an hour later, I hugged her and received a promise that she would do everything in her power to keep Maddie with me. Later that day, two police officers came to my apartment. They didn't have much hope of finding Fiona Ruiz. I gave them a copy of the photo of Maddie and her moom. On Tuesday, I returned to work, took Maddie with me, and enrolled her in our company, Daycara. Darlena Help had created about 15 years ago. I never used it for my kids because Tracy was a stay-at-home mom until the kids could look after themselves after school. But for me, playing a single dad, it was a godsend. At least until school started, I took Maddie to work with me in the morning, had lunch with her at noon, and took her home in the evening. Overall, it was a pretty nice setup. Having Maddie with me helped me get through my own children abandoning me. I rarely saw them, and when I did, I was usually just having dinner at a local restaurant. I didn't take Maddie with me when I went out with my kids, leaving her with a neighbor, Mrs. Olivares. They didn't need to show her how they felt about me. Maddie was a breath of fresh air to me. Due to lack of funds, she and her mother did little outside of their home. So much of what I did with Maddie was a new experience for her. The first time we went to a real restaurant, not some McDonald's, she was mesmerized, like someone who had just arrived from another planet. When we went to the park and stopped to eat a pretzel and drink a soda after she played on the playground, you would have thought I had invited her over for tea. I think she smiled for a week after the first time.
I know I smiled for a week after that, just listening to her exclaim about her experience. She started teaching me Spanish. Apparently, she was bilingual and laughed a lot when I mixed up words and phrases. One day at McDonald's, I ordered horse meat and Coke, and she laughed so hard she started crying. In her innocence, it never occurred to her that most people were not bilingual. I kept her at the same school she went to in first grade because it was the easiest for the school system. I had her birth certificate, so they didn't ask many questions when I listed myself as her contact and my apartment as her address. I have never heard back from the police about Maddie's mother or from the social service agencies who would like to place Maddie in foster care. Darlene must have twisted someone's arms for me, or the city officials simply decided they had too many outstanding cases to worry about Maddie and me. My cooking skills also improved because when Maddie stayed with me, Pizza and beer were not acceptable foods, so we started watching cooking shows on the Food Channel and cooked in the kitchen together. This is something I never did with my kids because Tracy was a great cook, I have to admit. But with my Maddie's help, I learned and became a better person, and we had a lot of fun in the kitchen. I won't lie and say that everything was perfect for us. We had disagreements and problems like any other family, but this was just like any other family. We've been together for just over a year. And Maddie and I have grown into our own version of a family. And this was pointed out to me at Maddie's school, at the beginning of third grade. One evening, we were at a school open house and were walking down the hallway when one of Maddie's friends and her parents came up to say hello. Maddie's friend introduced her parents as my mom and dad, and then Maddie introduced me as her dad. I had never even thought of our family in those terms, and when she called me her daddy, I almost fainted from the incredible joy of hearing those words. I choked for a second, my vision blurred, and I had to apologize to Reynolds for my moment of silence, saying that I had a piece of snack stuck in my throat. Maddie realized this, looked at me askance and squeezed my hand. She never called me Alex again, and nothing could have pleased me more. I was having so much fun being a parent again that I didn't even notice that I hadn't dated a woman in over two years when Maddie brought it up at the grocery store one day. We walked up and down the aisles, filling the cart with items from our shopping list, when in the produce section we passed a short woman. I didn't think anything of it, but Maddie glanced twice at the woman as we passed her. Wow, Dad, this is a really beautiful woman. You should ask her out, Maddie said. I was looking at my shopping list when she made this statement, so I immediately stopped the cart and took a closer look at the woman we had just passed. She was wonderful. And then she looked up at me, and we smiled shyly at each other. Well, aren't you going to tell her something, Dad? Maddie asked, looking at us. At this point, I wanted the floor to swallow me up, but what the hell? Maybe the woman would give Maddie and me a pass, so I tried it the old way. Hi, I'm Alex. This is Maddie. Like you just heard, Maddie thinks I should ask you out or something. I stuttered. And what do you think? She asked, looking me straight in the eye and giving me a million-dollar smile. Ooh. I was completely blown away. Caramel-colored skin, beautiful white teeth, a smile that could melt ice, and my heart. She looked to be about 35 years old, five feet two, 110 pounds, perhaps, and although she was wearing a light jacket, she seemed to have curves in all the right places and fit well in her jeans. There was no ring on her left hand. I quickly wondered if Maddie had noticed this. Would you like to have dinner with us some evening? All together. Or just you and me, if you prefer. Curb your ardor, Romeo, Maddie said teasingly in more Spanish. It was a good move, asking your daughter to look for single woman at the grocery store for you. The woman replied while I blushed. No, to be honest, it wasn't my idea. I would never do that, honestly. Yes, exactly, Romeo. Am I buying this? No, but yes, I would like that. Have dinner with both of you. By the way, I'm Cherry Roberts. Seriously? Was it that simple? Damn. I should have used that image a long time ago, I said, and she and I giggled. We made a date for next Saturday. She said she loves Italian food 
and Maddie and I have some good recipes. After we exchanged phone numbers and I gave her my address, Maddie and I turned to continue shopping. Maddie and I fist bumped as we turned the corner into the passage. Yes, no setup for sure, she shouted after us. Finally, the next Saturday arrived. I swear the days couldn't go any slower. After cleaning the apartment, Maddie and I got busy making homemade lasagna, garlic breadsticks and salad, and homemade tortoni for dessert. Cooking calmed my nerves because, to be honest, I was nervous as a cat. After all, it's been over 20 years since my last date, and then it downed on me, suddenly. It's been 20 years since my last date. Of course, all of those last dates were with Tracy, and I had to think hard to remember who I was dating before Tracy and I got together. I think it might have been Marianne Rizzo. Last I heard from her, she married the next guy she dated after me. I wondered if they were still married or if her marriage had gone in the same direction as mine. Calm down, guy, I finally said to myself. It's a date, just a damn date, and you're already thinking about marriage. I wasn't the only one who seemed ready for this. Maddie looked excited, too. She was next to me, helping me while we cleaned and then cooked. I didn't realize it, but Cherry was the first visitor to our apartment who wasn't Mrs. Oliver's or was older than, like, ten years. Dinner went well, I thought. It was a little nerve-wracking at first, but having an eight-year-old around is a great icebreaker. My mother was not married either. Have you ever been married, Cherry? She asked when I brought Cherry a glass of Galliano shortly after she arrived. Cherry blushed almost as much as I did at the question. She then looked Maddie straight in the eye and said softly, I used to be married to a wonderful man, baby. But that was in the past. I saw sadness and then pain appear on her face as she answered the question. Dad was also married, and he has two more children besides me, Maddie continued. At this point, I decided that I had better tell Cherry briefly about my marriage and divorce and how I became Maddie's father. She took it all calmly, with a stoic expression on her face. She and Maddie both looked a little teary when I got to the part about Maddie's mother not coming home. However, the sadness quickly passed for Maddie, who then asked Cherry about her name. Cool name, Cherry. Surely your parents were cheerful when you were a child. Well, that's a pretty funny story, baby, Cherry replied. Actually, my real name is Marcella, but for short, my name was Sella. One day at the grocery store, my little brother saw a box of Sella chocolate-covered cherries, and after that, he started calling me Cherry. It stuck, and now everyone calls me that, so that's what I'm called too. Well, it suits you much better than Marcella, I interjected. I see glasses with thick, dark frames, men's hands, and a strong butt. Ooh, that's harsh, Cherry replied, giggling. You will never, ever call me by my name. Cherry stayed with us until it was time for Maddie to go to bed at nine. Then she said that it was time for her to go, too. I hoped she was more than just being polite when she said she had a good time and that next time we should do it at her apartment. I gave her a quick peck on the lips as she walked out the door. For a brief second, I thought I smelled arousal, but so much time had passed that perhaps I was just dreaming. I like her, Dad. I think she'll be a good fit for us, Maddie said after I closed the door. I had to admit, at least to myself, that the child was right. For now, we had family date nights five Saturdays in a row, and I think we all had a good time. However, I knew I needed to try one-on-one -on -one to see if it had a chance of going anywhere. Maddie took the news well when I told her that I was inviting Cherry to the restaurant, just the two of us, and that she would spend the evening with Mrs. Olivares. I certainly wasn't going to leave Maddie at home alone like her mother did. I would never criticize Maddie's mom, but I wasn't going to leave my eight-year-old home alone while I went on a date. Besides, I think both Maddie and I were well aware that the last time she was left home alone, things didn't turn out well. I made a reservation at a nice steakhouse for our first alone date, as Maddie called it. I knew the mood would definitely be different when I showed up at Cherry's door to pick her up. She wore a somewhat tight-fitting silk dress, open at the front so that her ample breasts were clearly visible and short enough to make her slender legs appear a little longer. She wore a little more makeup than usual and wore a different perfume, 
something sexier and spicy, but not too strong. Damn, I completely forgot to take my stick. How the hell am I going to fight off all the other men? If you think this tongue will help you achieve anything, well, maybe you're right, she laughed in response. We had a great dinner and a nice conversation about more adult topics without Maddie, although it was a little strange that she wasn't with me. You miss her now, don't you? Cherry suddenly asked, looking straight into my eyes. Sort of, I admitted. Except for school and work, we are always together, and I don't mind one bit. You really miss the first two, don't you? She asked. It's terrible, although not with the attitude that appeared after I left. I know they are still children, but they don't even try to see things from my point of view. My ex really turned them against me. It seems to me that you get along well with children, I continued. If you don't mind me asking, why have you never had children? No, I don't mind. We were considering this issue at a time when I made the absolute dumbest decision of my life. I disrespected and cheated on my husband, all for the thrill of illicit sex. I was a stupid, dumb bitch, and I ripped the heart out of the only person I cared about more than anything in the world. This is a mistake I will never make again if I have another chance to love someone like that. Cherry's voice broke as she said the last part, but I caught every word, said in a barely audible whisper, her eyes filled with tears, which she tried unsuccessfully to blink away. I handed her my napkin and she carefully dabbed her eyes. I'm sorry if I made you go somewhere you didn't want to go, I said. I've never talked to anyone about this before, she said. Even with my parents, I'm too ashamed of myself. Then that's enough adult talk, I said. Let's hit this joint and see if you have moves on the dance floor, Missy. Missy? How old do you think I am? Twelve? Actually, I thought you were 35, but I'm 44, so to me, you're still a kid, I said. Really, 35? She was delighted. I'm 42. I was married for 12 years, divorced for nine years. You are very good for a girl's ego, sir. It can't be. You're only two years younger than me? I look like I could practically be your big brother. I laughed. I paid the bill, and we went to a dance club that Tracy and I visited sometimes. I'm no Fred Astaire, but Tracy loved going to dances, so one of the first things I did when we had some extra money was take some dance lessons. I quickly learned that sitting on the sidelines and watching your wife dance with other men is not a pleasant experience. Cherry was as light on her feet as she was light on her face. We danced to slow and fast music for about 30 minutes before I needed a break. Cherry looked like she could have continued, but she walked off the floor with me and we found an empty table. I went to the bar, and before I could leave the table, the first vulture swooped down on him. I watched what was happening from the corners of my eyes, trying not to appear too noticeable. I saw Cherry smiling and laughing. The vulture must have been a little funny, but she didn't move away from the table. I was more than pleased. She sucked on her margarita when I handed it to her. Very soon, vulture number two, a guy of about 25, arrived. He acknowledged my presence, but still turned to Cherry and asked if she wanted to dance. Sorry, Slick, but... The lady is with me. I don't really like it when people disrespect me, especially children. I spoke quietly but firmly, keeping a smile on my face. I know there was no smile in my eyes, although obviously the guy knew he was breaking protocol. Sorry, dude. I didn't know you two were a couple. He whined before sneaking away. We finished our drinks and went back to the dance floor, staying there for about 30 minutes. Another guy tried to butt in, but at least he had the sense to ask me first. When I told him no, he took it as normal, extended his hand and said, You shouldn't blame a person for trying. She is gorgeous. We returned to the table and both drank another glass. Just as we were finishing up, another vulture swooped in and asked my permission to dance with Cherry. I was tired, but decided that if she still wanted to dance, then I would let her go. She shook her head, and I told him the bad news. I took her home, and she invited me to come over for a while. It was only 10.30 p.m., and I agreed. We drank a glass of wine and talked easily for another hour. At that moment, I stood up, and she stood up with me. I didn't know how to end the date, 
and I must have looked like the proverbial deer in headlights because she giggled, which I really liked. I blushed deeply, and she knew I was in big trouble. Don't worry, Alex. We're not in a hurry, are we? She seemed to coo. Two weeks later, in my bedroom, I broke my zero streak for two years. It wasn't anything wild and crazy because Maddie was sleeping in the next room. But I can't tell you how good it felt to have the relief of a real woman in your arms. I didn't last long, but Cherry seemed okay with it. Although it was not part of the evening's plans, Cherry spent the night in my bed, pressed against my arm and chest. When we both got up for breakfast, she went to my closet and came out wearing a white shirt that covered the essentials, but still looked incredibly sexy. We headed to the kitchen where we were soon joined by Maddie, who let out a squeal when she saw Cherry was still with us. She ran up to her and threw herself into Cherry's arms, almost knocking her over. They hugged tightly and both seemed genuinely happy to be in each other's arms. It was almost comically affectionate, and I rolled my eyes at the couple. Pancakes! Pancakes! They both shouted in unison. Chocolate chip pancakes! I shouted back. Six months later, Cherry moved in permanently and we became the 21st century version of the Brady Bunch. Even though I was still paying alimony and child support, I was making a decent amount of money, and Cherry worked at an accounting firm and was also making a decent amount of money. Maddie didn't lack for much, although she didn't ask for much. I think when you grow up without a lot, almost everything can feel like a lot. I think it's all relative. And while we may have been a modern version of the Brady Bunch, I think we looked like a modern version of the odd couple, in this case, the odd trio. We were black, white, and Hispanic, and each of us had our own last name. Some of these issues were resolved when I enrolled Maddie in fourth grade in the fall. I listed her name as Maddie Ruiz Rogers. She was with me when I registered her, and her eyes got big when she saw what I wrote. She didn't say anything until we left the school, then she practically exploded. I can be Rogers like you. Is it true? She squealed. Not exactly legal, at least for a few more years, I replied. But according to the Rogers rules, you have the right to join the club. I made air quotes when I said Rogers rules, but that didn't stop Maddie at all. She jumped into my arms and started kissing my cheeks. After 30 seconds of celebration, Maddie pulled away and gave me a cold look. I was a little taken aback until she spoke. When can Cherry become Rogers? She asked. You know, this is a very good question. I'll have to think about it seriously. And I thought seriously. In fact, on the anniversary of our first date, I asked Maddie to stay with Mrs. Olivares while I went to the jeweler after work where I bought gifts for Tracy. Cherry said she would be home late and would have dinner herself, so I figured I had a couple of hours to find the right ring. It was a little after six when I walked out of Jean Horowitz Jewelers, having just designed a custom engagement ring. After ordering pizza for Maddie, Mrs. Olivares, and me, I drove to my favorite pizzeria in a small shopping center. Just as I was about to get out of the car, I glanced at a small but fashionable eatery located just a few minutes away. And at that moment, my world ended for the second time. My cherry entered the restaurant, hand in hand with a 40-year-old handsome black guy. She looked lively and very happy. I stared after them, unable to move or breathe or think. I don't know how long I sat in the car before I realized that I hadn't been breathing for a while and felt like I was about to pass out. I took a deep breath, then another. Then I decided that I needed to feed Maddie, so I went to the pizza place and placed an order. I drove home in a stupor, I don't remember much about the evening, at least until Cherry got home around eight. She was still animated and seemed to be in great spirits when she walked through the door. Hello? You'll never guess who I ran into tonight. My brother John snuck into town without telling me, and after I finished work, he invited me to dinner. I thought since you guys are eating pizza, I might as well grab a bite with him. She fell silent when she saw the expression on my face. Is this the story you came up with? I asked quietly. Cherry looked startled as the reality of what I said played out in her mind. You went to Salvatore's for pizza tonight, and you saw me with him, didn't you? And you thought, you son of a bitch, she yelled at me. 
I was more than a little surprised. Here I expected guilt and repentance, not attack. This must be some new way of apologizing, I thought to myself. Cherry had never swore at me before, but I was beginning to realize that she might have good reasons. You don't even trust me enough to give me the benefit of the doubt. I know that I lost my husband because I cheated on him. I told you all about it. I didn't hide anything. And I told you that I would never make that mistake again. I understand that your ex-wife left you with trust issues, but that's your problem with her. Don't you dare treat me so disrespectfully again, or I'll be out of here so fast your heed will spin. Mrs. Olivares apparently calmly walked out as Cherry exploded, and I saw Maddie sneak away to her room. I wished that the sofa I was sitting on would swallow me up, but no luck. You're right, I said quietly. I allowed the mistrust that Tracy sowed in my head to spread to you. You are a separate entity, and if I can't see that, then it's my fault, and I don't deserve you. I wasn't going to tell her about the ring just yet, but after I screwed up like that, I had to play my best card. She bared her teeth. If you could kill with a look, I don't think I would be walking the earth anymore. So, I know now is probably not the right time for this, but I need to show you how much I care about you. Give me your left hand. She slowly approached me and extended her hand, palm up. I turned it palm down, placed a piece of paper on her ring finger, and secured it with an elastic band from my shirt pocket. She looked puzzled, to say the least. What the? She said, taking the paper off her finger, unfolding it, and starting to read. You lousy asshole, she squealed. Seriously? Cherry then captured my lips with the most passionate kiss I had ever received, including anything Tracy had ever given. When we finished, she called Maddie to come out of her room. Look, baby, look, she said to Maddie, handing her the receipt for the ring. I'll become Rogers, too. The squealing laughter of a pair of joyful females sounds at a level too high for the males to hear comfortably, but I managed to keep my hearing while they jumped around the room. When they separated, Cherry pressed a button on her mobile phone and exclaimed loudly, You better come here and meet your future son-in-law. Maddie went and brought Mrs. Oliveira's back, so Cherry could show off her ring, and it was still Christmas morning in the apartment when Cherry's brother showed up. He was as handsome as a man, as Cherry was as a woman. Looking at him again, I couldn't even begin to thank him for the fact that he was her brother and not a boyfriend, as I thought. We shook hands when Cherry introduced us, but then he reached forward and grabbed me in a bear hug. A handshake is for friends, and although I want us to be friends, a hug is for family, he said, and they have to show you that if you hurt her, I will beat the life out of you. Understood? He squeezed his hand a little tighter as he said the last part. I wasn't breathing very well, and I got the point. Yeah, I sort of whispered back to him. Cherry briefly told him what happened before I gave her the ring. He looked at me with mocking surprise and said that he was glad that I was still alive. She looked at you with a laser death stare, didn't she? Asked John. Yes, she killed people with that look. Maddie and Mrs. Oliveras noted that they were smart enough to leave the room when they saw that look. Then he turned to Maddie, looked her up and down and said, So this is the famous Maddie Rogers. I have always wanted to have nephews and nieces. I think you'll be a great fit. Maddie smiled shyly and then her face lit up like a sunny day. Does this mean I can call you mom? She asked Cherry. Cherry didn't answer because she was crying. She reached out to Maddie and they stood there in an embrace for a long time, each crying their own tears for their own reasons. Even with Darlene's help, the state made us wait until Maddie was 16 before we could legally adopt her. At that time, she could already file for emancipation and go out on her own, but neither Cherry nor I were worried that this would happen. The government only sanctioned what Maddie, Cherry, and I created many years ago. Family is not always about blood and legal documents. And then, out of the blue, I hadn't heard a word from either of my kids since we last met over six years ago, so I was more than a little surprised when it was Haley on the other end of the line. I didn't bother looking at the caller ID and simply answered with my usual, Alex Rogers. Dad, it's me, Haley, she said quickly. Please don't hang up. 
Relax, baby. I would never hang up on you or your brother. Something happened? No, Dad. Everything is fine. Just wonderful. I'm getting married next month, and I would like to invite you to the wedding. I think I was as shocked as anything else. This was my little girl, and yet I was so removed from her life that I didn't even know the man she was going to marry in just a month. It was just after Ethan's 16th birthday that I last had contact with my children. We went to Ethan's favorite restaurant for his birthday. As usual, none of the kids were very talkative, despite my repeated attempts. Finally, right after we ordered dessert, Ethan said, Dad, I'm already 16, and court-ordered visits are over. Haley and I don't have to see you anymore if we don't want to, and we've discussed everything, and we don't want to see you. You abandoned us to preserve your stupid pride. Well, you can take your pride and shove it up your ass. I had to give my son credit. He was a great customer. Although he couldn't look me in the eyes when he talked to me, he never raised his voice. For her part, Haley continued to look from Ethan to me and back again. I breathed in, expecting this to happen one day. It was Tracy's handiwork. Her fingerprints were all over it. I assume you understand what wedding vows are and that your mother not only broke ours but threw them in my face. But she's obviously convinced both of you that I'm the bad guy here, and nothing I say will change your mind. But for me, breaking our wedding vows is not something I can just shrug off like, say, the family car breaking down. It's right in my soul, and even though I knew my leaving would hurt you too, me staying would be even worse because it would crush my soul and make me less than the person I am. Then we wouldn't be the same, and you would realize that when you grew up and lived long enough to see things as they really are. It was your mother's mistake, and she did a good job of shifting the blame onto me. Well, I won't take the blame. If this is what you both want, Dad, Dad, Haley said, bringing me back to the present. Don't you want to go? I really want to, Haley, baby. You know, I even put money aside for the day when this happens, I answered. You don't have to worry about money, Dad. Bob took care of it. Bob, I asked. I guess. But we're talking about Robert Goldstein III, aren't we? There were notes of irritation in her voice. Then they were replaced by pity. You didn't know then, apparently. Mom married Bob about six years ago, after we stopped seeing each other, she said. So this bastard ruined my marriage, ruined my relationship with my kids, ruined me halfway financially, and then married my ex-wife. And all this because of my pride, Haley? Every time my son demands an apology from me, don't be like that, Dad. I'm not inviting you here to cause problems. You won't give me away. You won't sit in front of your family. I just want you to be there, okay? Okay, Haley, on one small condition, that I can bring my family with me. Your family? Yes, even a loser like me has a family, Haley. I have a wonderful wife and we have an amazing daughter. You'll like both of them, if you ever spend any time with them. It was Haley's turn to get lost in thought. I never told her or Ethan about Cherry and Maddie. Honestly, I didn't want their mother to know. Do you have another child? Does she know about me and Ethan? She asked, almost as if in a trance. Maddie is 16. She is adopted. She and I have been together for nine years. I almost literally found her on the street. She knows everything about you two, what we once had, and what we no longer have. She is cheerful and full of life. She too had a setback, and we were there for each other at a very bad time in our lives, almost like it was scripted. Well then, I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of the family, Haley said, recovering from her shock. The wedding took place on Saturday evening, in rather luxurious surroundings, as befits the daughter of a fairly successful lawyer. We must pay tribute to old Bob, he did not skimp on his stepdaughter. The service itself took place in a beautiful old church in the city. The girls and I timed it so that we got there right before the service and sat in the last row. Yes, I noticed old friends and family but the fact that we arrived right before the service meant that we didn't have to socialize ahead of time. And when Haley and Mark were leading the procession out of the church, I received a kiss in my direction. We arrived at the reception in time enough to grab a table at the back of the room, which honestly wasn't fair to Cherry and Maddie, who had a girl's spa day on Friday and then both bought new dresses. Cherry's was sophisticated and sexy, 
and Maddie looked 21 when she wore full makeup for the first time. Every father's nightmare. But they both respected my wishes and didn't complain when we sat down after I went into the bar to get a glass of wine for Cherry and me and a Coke for Maddie. As I expected, various friends from earlier times began to stop by the table to say hello and chat as soon as they noticed me. Then Tracy's parents, Rhonda and William, arrived. Rhonda started crying as soon as she leaned in to kiss me. William hugged me tighter than when Tracy and I were married. I introduced Cherry and Maddie. Both Rhonda and Bill looked a little awkward, but I figured that was understandable. I'd been married to their daughter for 18 years. Since I didn't have a say or pay for the job, I didn't think it would be right for me to move around and work the crowd, so to speak. So the girls and I mostly stayed at the table when people came up to us. But I'm no fool, and I could see the reaction of many people who knew me that I was with a gorgeous black woman and a Spanish-speaking princess, in particular the reaction of the wives of former friends. You'd think I'd brought a trophy wife to the party. And just at that moment, Tracy and Bob our congenial hosts, appeared. Being married to someone for almost 20 years takes you into every nuance of someone's personality. And from the first moment Tracy laid eyes on Cherry, I knew she didn't like her. Maybe Cherry was too black. Maybe. Maybe Cherry was too pretty. More likely. Could Cherry have a flat stomach, great legs, and look 10 years younger than her age? Definitely. Could Cherry, with everything she had, just be with the one wrong guy in the room? Hell yes. With all the things going on in her head about Cherry, Tracy didn't even pay much attention to the fact that this was the first time in ten years that we had seen each other up close. She almost literally woke up when I walked over and kissed her on the cheek in greeting. Oh, Alex, I'm sorry. I had a little trouble moving in these new heels, she apologized. No problem, baby. You look amazing. I lied. Let's go meet my new family. I introduced Cherry, Maddie, Tracy, and Bob, shook Bob's hand as warmly as I could, introducing him to them as the instrument of my subsequent good fortune. Everyone except Maddie winced when I said this, but my daughter gave me a devious look and squeezed my left elbow. Did I tell you this kid is sharp? We chatted for about five minutes, not really saying anything, until Tracy and Bob left and the bride and her new husband arrived. As Tracy and Bob walked away, Maddie shook her head slightly, indicating that she was no more excited to see them than I was to see them. My second daughter, my fiancé, greeted me much warmer than I expected. She hugged me and began to cry, while my new son-in-law, Cherry and Maddie, stood in silence. I was completely taken aback by this and didn't know what to say when she finally let me go. Forgive me, Dad. For everything, she wheezed. I never understood what you were getting at until I repeated my own vow about two hours ago. Right as I was saying the oath, I was struck in the face by what you went through when your mother cheated on you and broke the oath. I never understood. I blamed you and your damn pride, just like Ethan. And now I understand completely. You were absolutely right when you acted the way you did and she was absolutely wrong when she not only acted the way she did, but also blamed you. How can I make up for the pain Ethan and I caused you? There was a lump in my throat the size of a football. I haven't cried since I tore cartilage in my knee playing soccer in 10th grade, but I came damn close, standing here with my family gathered around. How about you first introduce me to this handsome guy you made a vow with, and then do me the honor of dancing? I replied. Oh yes, of course, she said somewhat embarrassed. You haven't met the man of my dreams yet. Mark Westinghouse, meet your second father-in-law, Alex Rogers, my real father. We shook hands sincerely, and then I did my duty as a father and threatened him with my life if he ever hurt my daughter. I introduced him and Halle, Cherry, and Madie, and while everyone was introducing themselves, the orchestra started playing. Dad, Haley asked, tilting her heed towards the dance floor. I'm completely fascinated, I said, taking her hand. The crowd, which had started to boo louder when Haley greeted me, booed even louder as I led Haley onto the dance floor. I knew that at this point, I was starting to resemble Tracy and Bob, but I had many years to catch up. The band played what I like to call children's music, and although I hated it, 
I knew how to dance thanks to being married to a goddess who loves to dance. Haley was shocked that her newfound father was such a renaissance man, and we actually lasted two songs. By then, most of the crowd had gathered around the two of us. When the second song ended, Haley gave me another big hug, the crowd cheered, and Cherry and Maddie were waiting for me with bright smiles on their faces. I grabbed their hands and pulled them both down to the floor with me, and the three of us did our thing while everyone else joined us. Well, look at you, Mr. Rhythm, Cherry said in my ear as she came closer. Who would have thought that marrying off a daughter could be so much fun, I told her, quickly turning to Maddie. Well, let's wait a few more years. I'm not sure my heart can handle all this fun. Turn me on, old man, Maddie smiled back. All three of us stayed on the floor for six more songs. Then I left my girls, went to the bar for an ice jack, and sat down at my table to rest. As I watched Cherry and Maddie thoroughly enjoying themselves on the dance floor, I didn't notice Tracy come and sit next to me at the table. She touched my shoulder, and I instantly realized whose touch it was. This should have been our day, not Bob's and mine, Tracy said, leaning close to my ear. You threw away 18 good years. For what? You obviously didn't love me enough. I didn't turn my head in her direction. No, you're the one who clearly didn't love me enough to not do it at all. Especially after I told you what would happen if you did it. You didn't love me enough and you didn't respect me enough. But hey, you got Bob in a deal, and he's a pretty good catch, I'd say. And I got Cherry and Maddie, to quote the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you can find what you need. You were an asshole then, and you're an asshole now. Maybe, but I'm a lucky asshole who didn't lose a minute of sleep because of your bad decision. And no, I wasn't expecting an apology. I'm fine. Ethan came back into my life when he began a serious relationship with a woman several years ago. Loyalty seems to be much easier to understand when you have skin in the game, so to speak. He called me out of the blue and said that we needed to talk, and I invited him to the apartment. He was carrying a bottle of Jack Daniels Tennessee honey when I opened the door. Haley said you really liked this drink, and she decided that I should make you a peace offering, he said as I led him into the apartment. We only spoke briefly at Haley's wedding, and that was on shaky ground at best. That was over two years ago, and although Haley and I had made up, Ethan and I, at that point, had not yet made up. So I asked my girlfriend Sasha to be my wife, and it made me think about you and Mom. Haley has been telling me for years that you were the injured party in this matter, not Mom, but I didn't really see it until Sasha and I had the big talk that included our feelings about fidelity. Forgive me, Dad. I was a complete idiot. Now I understand everything. I just didn't want to hate my mom. I never asked you and Haley to choose sides, I replied. I just wanted you to know why I had to leave. Had to leave. Over the next few hours, Ethan and I discussed a lot of things over a bottle of whiskey. Cherry cooked a great dinner for us all as the four of us caught up. Ethan ended up sleeping on the living room couch because Cherry wouldn't let him drive her car after he shared a bottle of booze with me. Cherry, Maddie, and I sat at the groom's family table for this wedding, along with pregnant Haley and Mark and our first grandchild, two-year-old Brent, who sat next to Tracy. At least it allowed Tracy to not feel left out, since she was now on her own, since Bob had kicked her to the curb in favor of a trophy wife about a year ago. The kids kept me up to date on Tracy's affairs with occasional tidbits of news about her. I told them both that it was not wise to be the liaison between Tracy and me. We were adults, and if one of us wanted the other to know something, we could pick up the phone. Maddie flew in for the wedding. She's a freshman at Michigan State University, but she didn't want to miss her older brother's wedding, so I flew her out. She, Ethan, and Haley have developed a strong relationship so much so that they can joke about her by saying that she is my favorite child. I find it very interesting to watch them together. The argument that nurture trumps nature when it comes to raising children seems to ring true for us because Maddie and I have an unbreakable bond that even Cherry has noted. While I wouldn't want what we experienced in early childhood to happen to anyone else, adversity has brought us a little closer than we otherwise might have been. Adversity also probably helped Cherry and me. 
We both know that we can never take anything for granted and we cherish our time together as we figure out our new lives as single parents. I can tell it didn't take Cherry long to realize that an empty nest meant no one in the next room was listening in, and she went all out in the bedroom. Hearing her screams of pleasure just makes me go crazy and want to give her even more pleasure. There are mornings when we both get ready for work, a little stiff and sore, after a wild night of gaming. Once all the usual wedding stuff was completed at the reception, Cherry and I hit the dance floor. Maddie also danced with one of Ethan's groomsmen, but not before Ethan warned them that they shouldn't mess with my father's favorite child, or they'd face hellish retribution. I chuckled when he said that. I returned to the table after half a dozen dances, but Maddie wanted to dance with me, so I stayed for one more. I noticed that Cherry and Tracy had nothing to say to each other, even though they were sitting within speaking distance. Do you feel the frost coming from that side of the room? Maddie asked when she was within talking distance. Insightful. When I finally returned to the table, Cherry stood up and joined Maddie on the dance floor. A minute later, I felt a touch on my shoulder. Obviously, we have entered the second round, I thought. So, are you going to gloat about Bob leaving me? Tracy asked, leaning towards me. Not my circus, not my monkeys, I replied. I know this might surprise you, but I rarely think about you at all. I don't wish you harm, but I don't care about your life and what happens to it. We had 18 wonderful years, and that was many years ago. I have a new life now, and I don't want to waste time thinking about the past or what could have been. I had been watching the dance floor while we were talking, and now I turned to face Tracy. And then I saw her fear, fear of going into retirement alone. This was another factor that she apparently didn't take into account all those years ago because she thought I should back down in the face of her threats to ruin my life in the divorce. For a brief moment I almost felt sorry for her, but then I realized that she would try to crush my soul if the roles were reversed in this conversation. You know I was an asshole then, and I'm still an asshole now, I said, getting up from the table and joining my girls on the dance floor. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.